quiz for only one day, not today, but remember, I was just wondering if I was to give quiz today, like one third of the class present. You have one quiz left for the last unit, so be prepared for that. I don't want you to miss the classes. Just one week to go. I was planning for today, but I mean, you can see that I think more than half the class is not in today. <laughs> They didn't know which one to use. This one. Okay, so I have to go bring this back. No, no, this is after this. I'll take it back. Because the lady that the new lady said she wants it. Yeah. To get back to special doesn't have me. <laughs> okay. But remember, it's not going to be announced. So it's going to be a pop quiz. So we have had, we have had a, at least two announced quizzes. So I don't want to make it a announced quiz. So be prepared for that. And just and. Uh, I think Dr. Mokhazi must have told you that I'm not going to take lecture on Friday. Mo Friday, he's going to take my lecture. Right. All right. Were you planning for something? Oh, you like my lecture. You have a couple more lectures to say that. And you will be interested to know that I will come and look for Angkor if he's there or not. That's what I normally do. When I come first thing more. All right. Anyway, uh, so you, you are on the watch list. Easier for me to watch you. You cannot hide. Okay. So we're going to talk about one last lecture in virology. Uh, retroviruses. This is a group of viruses. And I just picked up uh, actually a disease. It's easier for you to relate to. Uh, many of you will, may or may not know that uh, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, basically is a retrovirus. And if you go back and want to read the basic lectures on uh, virology, you'll see what are the differences between retrovirus, why do we call them retrovirus, what is special about these retroviruses, because this is going to be one of the most important things for your desk. And the, you know, AIDS and uh, treatment for AIDS and all that stuff is, is, is very important. <coughs> Anyway, I'm just going to go through acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which obviously is a disease. Uh, we all teach, especially for uh, pharmacy class or for other medical school, or dental school, that it is caused by a virus. So uh, that's what the former Surgeon General's idea is. And that actually will tell you as to where do we stand in terms of AIDS and where do we stand in terms of the transmission of AIDS and the problems we have in control of AIDS. And again, it's taking a lot of talk for the pharmaceutical industry and as you know, we are still struggling uh, to figure out the, uh, the treatment and vaccine formation and for this lecture, some of the basic things I just want you to keep in mind is that why is it that our vaccine is failing and why is it that we are having problems in terms of treating of HIV patients. And one of the things obviously is obvious over here because we cannot advise people to practice abstinence. Even if they were to do that, you can see from here, you know, the problem that we may have in controlling the behavior of a group of people. Well, let me take you through a history. Interestingly, for many of you who may already know it, that uh, interestingly, I was a first year medical student in 1981. So that's can calculate my age. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> I was a first year medical student at the time, and I was listening to Newsweek and all these things. And uh, remember these viruses, like retroviruses are oncogenic viruses. These are oncogenic viruses, 
and uh, these are the viruses that cause problems, right? You can remember about the basic qualities of viruses. So this virus, I mean, this was a condition called Kiprasi's sarcoma. Of course, sarcoma is kind of a malignancy. And this was a rare form of cancer. And we know it, we teach it, it's because of many reasons. It is very, very particular in a particular Jewish population and in older Jewish population. And that's for sure a lot of data is available and there are reasons behind because of intermarrying and so on and so forth. But now, some of the patients were seen, especially of uh, Kaposi sarcoma in white gay population in San Francisco. That's where it started with. But you just have to remember that there was a good sense of uh, clinical history taking and there was good sense of association of these kind of things. Remember we talked about bioterrorism and there was something that you would hit your mind. If something is rare, right, and all of a sudden you see four people coming up with this kind of a problem. Does it ring a bell? So then you want to find out what is it common between those people. And it so occurred that they happen to have a cluster, we call a cluster, where a group of people get infected in the same area. And if you, if you were to take their sexual history, it occurred that they were all homosexual and they were kind of having sexual relationships with each other. So that kind of rang a bell for a physician practicing at, at, uh, in San Francisco. Now remember at the same time, another thing somebody noticed was that uh, there were some of the patients in New York where people, especially who were using uh, drugs, intravenous drugs, they were also showing this cancer. Now they are obviously 3,000 or 4,000 miles apart, and this is where careful observation and careful thinking comes uh, in your mind. Now what happened was that another incident happened was that they also found out there is a, a rare lung infection, rare lung infection that can only take place if you have a compromised immunity. So if your immune system has really gone down, only then you should suffer from an infection it's called pneumocystis carini, especially pneumonia. So these were young white males, right? And all of them suddenly show up and they are having pneumonia and they found out that when they cultured it, normally they would not culture this kind of, uh, you know, fungi, but that's what it was, pneumocystis carini pneumonia, PCP, and it's a known entity. Interestingly, well, there was a lot of information at that time and people wanted to take credit for coming up who discovered HIV, who discovered the virus and so on and so forth, types of viruses. There's a lengthy history. But one thing I want to emphasize for you as young pharmacists is that there was this young lady, she must have been young in 1981, I don't know, Sandra Ford, a drug technician. So she's working in CDC. And what she noticed was that there is a high number of requests for a drug, pentamidine. I mean, she should, could have just done her work, you know, like a machine and would not have noticed. But she was intelligent enough to pick that up. And she found out not, not only that, a doctor was prescribing to a gay man in his 20s who had pneumonia. Interesting. Not only that, but she also found out that this two weeks later, the same doctor called to ask for a re refill of a rare drug. So that something struck her. Why would that happen? Nobody would have called for this medicine. Remember, these are not sold normally on the, in the pharmacies. So CDC keeps a record, keeps a stockpile for many things which may be obsolete for academic interest. And normally patient would take it for a, for a 10 day treatment and either they die, right, because they couldn't come out of that, but nobody would ever ask for a refill. So she was the one who figured that out that something is going wrong. So she wanted to kind of report it to the statistic person and want to really 
find out as to what was happening. Right? At that time, they actually had to go and find out that what this patient had, and it was a little bit of a long history that they went back and to prove that it was infectious in nature. Only thing they would do is that, well, there were people at that time, I remember in 1980s, that they were, you know, so-called religious group, and they said, well, this is something, some evil that you do and you pay for, and so on and so forth. But as a scientist or as a physician, they wanted to find out the link. Why is it that all four white gay people have the same problem? So obviously, it, it rang that it should be something infectious, right? But anyway, it's a long story. It took them a couple of years to relate a typical microorganism to a disease process, and that obviously is not easy in order for you to prove. Even now, if you were to go back and Google it and do the history, you'll find out there are still people, especially I heard in South Africa, there are some scientists, and they happen to be very top-notch scientists, they still do not believe that AIDS is caused by HIV. But most of the physicians and most of the scientists as well do believe. Right? So remember, this was a challenge that took a couple of years. But anyway, uh, what we know today is that actually we can trace this virus. Obviously, virus was found in those patients, and then the patients in New York, they wanted to find out the link, and there was no link. They wanted to report to CDC, report to WHO if something else was happening in any part of the world. And what we know today is, which like an accepted view, that they think that this actually was first identified in chimpanzees in West Africa. And that happened to have a source of HIV infection in humans. And what they believe is that there were people, those tribes in this area, they were hunting for the meat for this special kind of chimpanzees. And they came in contact with the blood, or they came in contact. So it, it took a while before the chimpanzees will deliver it to human beings. And that's what most of scientists now believe, that it must have been there for ages, and it took a couple of years they think maybe like 10 years, for the virus to travel from Africa to different parts of the world. We still do not know precisely as to how and where, but uh, most of the uh, specialists would say that the, probably the first case must have been in the Africa, well in 19, they think maybe, it's like speculation, in 1950s, and then, remember, they also found out, like any other viruses, these viruses do mutate. Retroviruses have this ability to mutate. So that's another challenge. If a person has a virus, he gets infected with one virus, over time the virus mutate in his body, and he may come up with another strain of virus. So that's like a rapid mutation. That's another challenge that we have in terms of developing a drug for HIV. But anyway, most of the scientists believe it started in Central Africa and then they think because of migration and people moving from this part of the world to the rest of the world and they brought virus to these areas. So we had first case reported, they think, in 70s in Europe and in Asia as well. And then uh, mostly they, the theory for US is that they think that it came from Haiti. That's another theory because they thought most of the people had some relation with Haiti. It came to Haiti and from Haiti it came to San Francisco and so on and so forth. And now the, the accepted view is that it's actually, we have two different kinds of HIV viruses. There are many names for that, I don't want you to go in de detail, but two obvious source of infection which was HIV-1 and HIV-2. They started out in these two countries and then spread to the rest of the world. And the first case we noticed in U.S. and as a matter of fact in the whole world was those four young white gay men in San Francisco. Okay, now this is the statistics as of December 2008. So you can also think it started out with 1981 and within 30 years, I would say 30 years, this is what we have today, and remember one thing when you see these kind of statistic, statistical data, there's difference between 
you being infected and you have a disease. You already know the basic micro. You may get infected but may not have a disease. You may be a carrier. You can pass it on. All those things uh, you should keep in mind. There's a difference between infection and showing disease. Because the latent period of these viruses is very lengthy. One of the largest latent period, like 10 years. So a person may have had a sex or sexual partner and he got that virus from him or her and then it stayed in his or her system for 10 years before he has full-blown HIV. And the reasons for that we'll discuss in a while. Now you can see we have as of 2008 33.4 million adults in the world. Interestingly, I mean that's a really interesting thing, out of this 33 million, 30 million are in Africa. And some of the countries have so high statistics that one third of the whole country has AIDS. So you can imagine the, the spread and you can also imagine the, uh, the intensity of HIV. And not only that, you also see a very high incidence of children under 15 years and women as well. Because that was another challenge they wanted to find out uh, statistically how is it. Remember somebody uh, asked me the other day a question, I talked about MS, MSM, men having sex with men, and why don't we care about WS, WSW? Right? The reason is, number one is that there's no statistics available and 99% of the reported cases of WSW have had a other sexual experience as well, like penetrative male sex. So the data is not valid, it's not like exclusive for that. So that's one of the reasons they think that even those uh, patients that fall into that category doesn't really represent that truly. Right? So it's difficult to classify that. Right? Does it make sense? So, but it is an entity like MSM, we have WSW. But because of the uh, differences, because of these reasons, it's difficult to come up with any statistical analysis. Anyway, uh, people newly infected per year, 2.7 million. So we have about 3 million people getting infected every year and it's on the rise. It's on the rise. Right? And then, uh, as well as deaths, so you have two million deaths only in 2008 because of AIDS. So you can see the problem of the AIDS, you can see the intensity of AIDS, where is it coming from and the problems that we may have. And also keep in mind a very high death toll for children under 15 years. <coughs> That's another important thing that you have to keep in mind. <coughs> Alright? Okay, now <coughs> Uh, 7,400 new HIV infections a day. We have like 7,000, you can imagine the intensity, the pressure on the physician and the pharmacist and industry, that you have about 7,000 or more cases detected of HIV per day. And then more than 97% are in low or middle income countries. That's another problem, I told you. And then we have children, and then we have younger generation. And interestingly, we do have 48% uh, among women, about 40% among young people. So that's another thing because of the sexual preferences, because of the uh, behavior, and so on and so forth. This happens and targets a young generation. And it started with male homosexuals, but now it's prevalent everywhere. And remember, another important thing, I want to uh, go back to that. Uh, you see over here, in Africa you see both male and female. So basically you see, it's kind of equally uh, important for both male and female in Africa. But as we move to the Western world, you see more males. You see over here, more males. So that's again linked to uh, MSM, homosexuality practice among the males. Let me come. It's going to come. Next slide. Just have to bear with me. All right. Now, uh, so you can see the infections today, the intensity for that. And this is estimated number of adults and children newly infected with HIV only in 2008. 
So I don't think you'll be able to see over here, but I can read it out for you. 55,000 in North America as compared to sub-Saharan Africa, 2 million in one year. So we had 2 million new cases in this part of the world in 2008 alone as compared to well, uh, 170,000 in Latin America. The lowest incidence obviously is in East Asia and it's about, uh, about like 75,000. But total population you can see we had 2.7 million only in 2008. Now this is US statistics. So this is from the CDC which would give you estimated rates per 100,000 population. So these are the rates per 100,000 population and the maximum you will see for example over here so 500 people per 100,000 population are infected. So you have all these states Florida, Texas, California and the upper part of the north very very high incidence and this is as of 2007 and you can see uh, some of these areas maybe it wasn't reported, it wasn't calculated or it was less than 2.2 uh, per 100,000 of the population but it's pretty much high with the data 483 per 100,000 of the population so very high so that's a really public health problem and you have to deal it as a pharmacist, we have to deal as physicians but it is there and it's increasing uh, every year. Okay, now this will tell you estimated rates for adults and adolescents living with HIV infection. So these are the ones that may not have full-blown AIDS, but they are infected. So these are the rates of infection. Remember I told you showing a disease is different. So these are some of the states, again you can see over here as well, if you compare this, Louisiana and I don't, it's like, uh, which state is Atlanta? Is it Atlanta? Georgia. Huh? Yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, you can see over here that a lot of people are infected and the reason is many a time, especially in high schools and college going adults, we do HIV testing. That's number one thing that we want you to be at a higher level of understanding for a public problem that's there in a community and especially for your roles uh, as a future pharmacist as well. So you have to really keep that in mind. These are based upon HIV testing uh, of especially the college, you, you saw the age group, that's like a typical age group of the college going students and even high school and also because of the uh, risk that the youth take. So there's a risky behavior, especially in the youth, they want to go and test for everything. So this is another thing that CDC thinks is important and we really have to keep that in mind. Okay, you can see from here, <coughs> this is percentage of uh, population having HIV positive, not necessarily showing a disease and you can see from 1991 to 2007, uh, about 80%, it was 80% in a black population, 80% of HIV positive and that actually by now it's about like 60% and then we have Hispanic and then we have the white non-Hispanic against about like 50% according to the year. So that's another problem. You can see the incidence of this disease and we only talked about that it is linked with their sexual promiscuity or sexual experiences that they go through. Uh, we also care because many of these girls, especially who are HIV positive, they also get pregnant. So that's another thing. So you can see a very high pregnancy and these are the pregnant girls who are HIV positive and yet give birth to, to children. That's another concern. We're going to talk about that. That there's a group of population there and remember it's going to take a lot of toll in terms of treatment, in terms of management and I must have told you uh, many a times that uh, in of the 19th I used to work in um, uh, New York and there was a concern that people and physicians stopped working and dealing with HIV patients because you never know. You know, everybody, there's a big scare there that what if I'm going to touch the patient, 
you know, because you come in close proximity with the patient, and all these things were there. People working in, you know, uh, prenatal group, people working in pediatrics. So these are all real concerns. But you should be familiar as to what is the established data and what do we really know. And again, also you can see it's also linked with abortion as well. So HIV is really important in terms of the populations that get infected and the management that we do for these patients. Okay, I'll read it for you. I'm sorry, you know, I just kind of copy and paste from CDC statistics, but it will give you the data that CDC maintains. And this step actually gives you the, it's called youth risk behavior. It's a youth risk behavior. That's what the CDC maintains in terms of trying a drug, in terms of any experimentation that the youth do. And that actually includes sex and sexual preferences and also uh, the different uh, behaviors, sexual behaviors that the teens have. Okay, uh, let me read it for you over here. This is based upon the statistics that uh, CDC has as of 2007. Uh, female, male, and total number. And it's based upon uh, those, especially high school students, who have had four or more sexual partners in a year. So you can see the number of, number of high school students as of 2007, uh, as compared to race, we have like 10% females, as compared to 12% male, total about like 11%. As compared to black population, we have 18% in female, about 37% or 38% in male, and 27% on aggregate. In Hispanic, we have 11%, 23%, and actually it also takes into account their grades as well. So you can see over here, the CDC maintains that they start having sexual, and just like a ninth grader having at least four partners per year. So you can imagine the intensity, where is it coming from? So ninth graders, 10th graders, it kind of increases as they move on to their grade. So you can see uh, t 12, like 20%. So it's pretty much high, right? And, this, and not only that, you also see that uh, this is the data based upon four or more, but this is the data currently sexually active. You see uh, the high school students in white population 30%, black population about 50%, and Hispanic population about 40%. So this is something that people, uh, these students have agreed to. And that's based upon the history taking. And you can see that uh, it's like 95% confidence interval. I think Dr. Mukherjee must have told you the data. What does that mean? 95% confidence interval, pretty stable data. So you can see the problems that we have in terms of managing, collecting data. Because one of the management of this AIDS is that we're going to talk about education and education to high school students and high education to, you know, uh, to the health uh, professionals as well. So this is something which is really scary out there, uh, especially in terms of uh, risk behavior survey that we have. And uh, incidentally, we don't have these kind of, for the rest of the world, it's easy to do these statistics uh, in this country, and they are available. All right, let's talk about routes of infection. <coughs> I want you to pay attention to uh, the key over here in the here. Major route of infection in resource rich countries. And major route of infection in resource poor countries. There's another thing people used to think is a poor man's disease. Well, not necessarily. Right? And then again, also keep in mind the sexual practices that are happening in a richer population as compared to a poorer population. Right? And there's also some of the particular uh, professions involved. I'll talk about that in a while. But remember, <coughs> let's see over here, uh, male, homosexual, or bisexual. There was another thing, remember, that many male who consider themselves or declare themselves to be homosexual, they basically are bisexual. So likewise, those women who uh, declare themselves to be lesbian, basically they're also bisexual or they have had a bisexual uh, kind of experience once or twice or more in their lifetime. So data is not really consistent with that. So we take as most of the people as heterosexual. So they're having sexual practice here, there with everything that they want to experiment everything. That's what it is. 
And remember, as a basic uh, microbiology student, you remember, regardless of what sexual practice you have, whenever your skin, any part of your skin, comes in contact with any part of the skin of another person, or your skin and any part of the mucosa of another person comes in contact, you are in trouble in terms of being uh, transmitting or receiving any of these microorganisms. Does it make sense? Because these are the barriers there. All right. Now, there's another group of population, intravenous drug users. They are also there. And many a time, I mean, I, I don't want to complicate the data, but many a time those people who do have different sexual uh, preferences or experimentation, they also experiment with the drugs as well. Because remember in the last slide I said those high school students who have had m more than four partners per year, they were the same people who also experimented drugs. Because you are in experimental mode, they're going to experiment many things. So they may also fall, apart, uh, fall into this category of intravenous drug uses. And again, uh, female heterosexual, you can see from here. Uh, the only problem with this case over here is that female heterosexual may pass it to the child, and child may get infected in utero transmission. That's another uh, unfortunate part of this whole schema that uh, the children can also get infected. Not only that, remember there are other sources of infection as well where you carry via another thing. Like for example, in this case you have injections. If you are using unsafe injections in many parts of the world, in Africa, and incidentally uh, most of this HIV transmission in Africa is heterosexual. Right? And that's what's a bigger part of that. So don't really go into that kind of a mindset that's only in a particular group. It's once you are in the group, you never know because it's very difficult to get the data, a true data if a person's sexual preferences. So you can see from here, uh, vertical transmission is also possible. But this happens to be the major drought in the resource-rich country. So homosexuality, MSM remains as one of the major source of infection in U.S., in, in any of the Western world, as compared to uh, heterosexual in these two. So that's, that actually gives you an idea why I said that we see about 30 million of the world population of people suffering from AIDS in Africa, and especially sub-Sahara. Okay, uh, uh, just a slide will give you an idea. Uh, pay attention to the initial infection. It takes weeks, then months, and you're talking about years. Things are a little bit different because you may get infection by HIV virus. We talk about how it gets into your system, and your immune system responds to it. And remember, there is no way of us knowing uh, whether, well, of course, there is a way of us knowing that you should be tested if you do fall in those category and high risk behavior patients, if you happen to be in high risk. Otherwise, it's difficult for us to uh, tell, especially if you don't have any kind of. Uh, you know, uh, errant sexual behavior, but the injections, you know, the unsafe injection, blood, and many other things that you may come in contact with may also give you, uh, you know, a, another added risk factor for you having HIV. So what happens is that once you have an HIV, your immune cells respond to it, and that usually takes a couple of weeks. Then for these viruses, especially retroviruses, they can be there to cause an active disease or they can cause and persist and stay over there for latent, can stay over there for months, right? Or they can actually uh, stay over there in years. Depending upon your immune status, depending upon the risk factor. Another important thing to keep in mind is the person is, is in that, for example, a particular uh, high risk group and he is doing what he's doing. So it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to get infected with only one strain. He may get infected with more than one strain at the same time. Because virus has this capability to mutate. I'll talk about that. It's very important for you to know that this virus does mutate. And in this case, we need to know how it mutates. I'll just cover the basic things. But I really want you to... Uh, well, I think the, the speed at which I'm going, I may want to take another lecture on that tomorrow as well. 
So we'll extend one because it's going to take me a while. Especially, I want you to pre be prepared for the antiretroviral therapy drugs for the AIDS. So you have to have some basic uh, micro and immuno information to really understand as to what is the basis of that. But anyway, just keep in mind that a typical virus enters your system, challenges your immune cell, and goes into your lymphatics. You have lymphadenopathy. Many a times, uh, the only thing that you see in this AIDS patient is lymphadenopathy. So all the lymph nodes swell up. That's another thing we call generalized lymphatics. So all the lymphatics actually, uh, they kind of increase in size, but they are persistent. They can be persistent. You want to exclude the sites. You want to exclude the causes of lymphadenopathy. It's not easy. It could be bacterial, viral, parasitic, and many other things are there. But nevertheless, over years, you may have a full-blown AIDS. And many a times, we would not know unless you are presenting with an opportunistic infection. Remember, pneumocystis carini in those patients, you know, that was the beginning of us, you know, finding out that why is it that this particular uh, age group or, you know, uh, patients who should be normally have patent immune system, they're suffering from something which is so benign, and they are becoming resistant to that as well. So that's something that we also keep in mind. And sometimes, many a time, it does involve your central nervous system as well, and uh, you may present with subacute encephalitis or dementia. And there are many other, uh, remember we talked about that in bacteriology as well, almost all the time when your immune system goes down, you have this immunodeficiency. And this type of immunodeficiency that you get is not congenital, it's called acquired. Remember we talked about immunodeficiencies. There was something which was like congenital. You have problem with the machinery, but now it's acquired. So you acquire this infection and you are immunodepressed. Yeah. Where does that say? Uh, well, there's a question mark over here. It's very difficult for us to uh, really uh, decide the fate of this patient in terms of percentages. Remember, it has to have a 10-year data, and you have to follow those patients up. We do have some of the data, but the chances are that once you have an HIV, it's going to stay with you for your life. So once you get infected, you are infected. The only thing is that you may or may not show the disease, a full-blown disease. And of course, we'll talk about that. There are some survivors. People say that they've been surviving for the last few years, and there are reasons for that. I'll talk about it. There's an immunological reason for that. Right? But for like herpes virus, I said in herpes virus, once you get infected, you have virus for the rest of your life. Once you get it with infected with HIV, there is no way that you can get rid of that is going to stay in your system. The, the drugs that we normally uh, use was to prevent you having a full-blown AIDS. Or want to protect your immunodeficiency. Want to treat your uh, chances of getting opportunistic infections. Does it make sense? Yes? All right. Okay. Uh, so you can see a lot of opportunistic infection that includes HSV as well, cytomegalovirus, and all those kind of benign so-called even... Uh, you know, parasites that can come and cause problems. So this is like a generalized scheme that you may have once you get an initial infection and it's going to take years. And remember I already talked about incubation period which happens to be about like 10 years. Okay, well this is, this is a typical dendritic cell and these are the viruses. And this uh, why do you see these viruses attacking dendritic cells? You remember we did talk about uh, there was one special type of cell that these viruses like. What is, what is that type of cell? CD4 positive T cell, right? And these are the major cells that are responsible for adaptive immune response. But in this case you see them on top of dendritic cells. Can somebody give me an idea as to what you think they are doing here? Any guess? Yeah. Say it again? Attaching to the membrane and injecting 
Okay. You, 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 they say they're infecting them? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's right. But also remember that the only cell that is going to process an antigen has to be a dendritic cell. So CD4 T cells get infected, but they cannot process an antigen. In order for any virus or any particle to be processed and seen by CD4 T cell, it has to go, go through antigen presenting cell. CD4 T cells are not antigen presenting cells. The only cell type, especially dendritic cells, are professional APCs. Right? In the process, you are right as well, they are infecting them as well. And actually, sexual transmission usually is via macrophages. The macrophages, uh, your macrophages lining your mucosa in your sexual organs will pick up a virus from the partner and take it to your system and present it to your system. That's the normal carrier. But remember that they like, they are fond of CD4 T cell, but they can also infect other antigen presenting cells because that's the way the immune system works. CD4 T cells cannot present antigen and that's the basis of one of the important pharmacological concepts that you have to keep in your mind. Right? So I just brought this slide to tell you that these are dendritic cells. You can see dendrites and these are small little viruses that are infecting. So technically you're right, they are also infecting them and they're going to, but many times it actually go and find a, uh, a niche there and they are going to, to go and uh, be presented in uh, HLA type A MSC. Is it class one or class two? Two. So you're going to fail my immunology class, you're going to say class two. When we talked about viruses being presented most of the time in MSC class one perspective. You remember that? Like a couple of years ago we studied immunology. <laughs> right? <laughs> a couple of years. All right. Anyway. Uh, and there are dendritic cells. You can see dendritic cell, or actually a, a birding. That's a typical birding of the virus. So a person at a given time may have like a person who is infected with HIV, you can see the potential of this person infecting another person is that he has at a given time 10 billion HIV viruses. So you can imagine about the dose that you will get from that person, he is already shedding off billions of viruses. Or they are kind of replicated 10 million a day. So you are talking about millions and billions of these. You can see this is one cell. One cell budding up. And you know there are how many cells are there? How many CD4 T cells are there? Thousands in small cubic milliliter. So we're talking about billions of cells. So that's like the risk factor over here. This is another burning. You see the burning of this virion. It's going to go and spread and cause infection. These can see these little tiny viruses. They have just bud off from one cell. So you can imagine the treatment modules we have, you can imagine the drugs, what's going to happen if you have such a high propensity of these viruses. Because obviously they are tiny in size but they have this capability to, to reproduce. But a uh, good thing is that half-life is about like a couple of hours, uh, six, seven hours. But the, the capability to replicate is, is a lot. So they can quickly, quickly uh, divide, but they can stay in the system and then our immune system should be able to remove that. <coughs> okay. Uh, I'll just take you through this slide and stop here because it's going to get complicated and this is something that you need to know for sure. This is one of those viruses, I didn't stress that in, in any other viruses other than uh, RNA or DNA, but this is something that you want to know each and every protein. This is something you want to know not only each and every protein, even the cleavage protein, enzymes cleaving it, because that's the basis, basis of antiretroviral therapy. And you never know, you happen to practice or uh, be in a clinic, you're going to deal with HIV patients. And since it's like a chronic disease, the chances are pretty much high for all of us, all of you to really go and manage this patient. So you, uh, this is a T lymphocyte surface area, right? 
And this is a CD4 T cell and it has an antigen called CD4 antigen. And remember that very first step for this virus is to bind to a cell. Remember if that binding doesn't take place, that's why the very first thing is binding, right? Attachment. Absorption, absorption, that's the very first step, if you remember, and then penetration, we'll talk about that. So it would not take place unless and until you have corresponding receptors. One of the receptors, the cell must have to present to these viruses is CD4 antigen. You can see CD4 antigen. This CD4 antigen is present on CD4 T cell. It is also present on macrophages as well. If it was not present on macrophages, the macrophages would not get infected. Does it make sense? Okay, this is how it's, it's a very specialized kind of attachment. Now, interestingly, I don't want to go in detail today, but also tell you, remember I said that, uh, rem remember my word I said that the T cell has to see things with two eyes. The T cell has to see things with two eyes. So many times it's going to go for, look for two receptors. And that's like some of the laws that we have, we have, you know, two T's, because that's more secure. Yes. So many important things. The T cell is very important, it's going to go and proliferate, and spawn, very important T cell. So it's most of the time, it could be more than two, but it's like two signals, because if it's only one signal, it's not very really secure. So in this case, it's like a bank locker, you usually have the two keys. So it needs another receptor as well. In this case, it happens to be a chemokine receptor we call CCR and many are uh, drugs actually if you must have attended I think a couple of months ago there was a presentation on the new therapy for uh, AIDS and they are talking about working on chemokine receptors CCR5 many will talk about that there are many names for that but just remember it has to be two signals before everything uh, was seen so we have so this is a story for the T cell. As far as virus is concerned, so you can see over here it has a lipid bilayer for obvious reason because this is going to bud off. So lipid bilayer. And also keep in mind, as I said the other day, that what happens with the lipid bilayer, you know, in terms of their kind of uh, sensitivity, in terms of their, uh, you know, survivor and so on and so forth. I don't want to repeat that. But just keep in mind that we have then uh, some of these external protein, they are like studs.